So today, <laughs> today we're joined by John Asquith. Yeah, you got it right. Well, <laughs> so if you've not heard of Action Coach, you should have. Action Coach is the largest business franchise organization in the world by 10 times. Something like that. 72 yeah. countries. More than that now. So it's the largest business coaching franchise. In the world. In the world. I think it's the largest and B2B, uh, B2B it's like white collar franchise. And in that largest business fr coaching franchise in the world, there is the best and the best <laughs> coaching franchise. The head of that, who's been coach of the year for the last four years, mm -hmm. is your man, John Asquith. Yeah, supposedly. Welcome to the show. Thanks, mate. All right. So let's crack straight into the <laughs> the first question. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a lot of business coaches. Yeah. What's the difference between a business coach and the best business coach in the world? Well, you'll have to tell me who the best business coach in the world is. Much as you, we've just been through it. No, I, <laughs> I look after a, l a lot of people, and that's mm. probably what determines success in, in this game. But I think the... The best out there deliver results, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's lots of people that talk a good game. I think it's an industry that's unregulated, right? So you could call yourself a coach, and hey presto, that's you're you're a coach, right? So um, there's experience, there's, ex there's expertise involved, but because it's unregulated, you have lots of people putting the the tag that they're a coach, but they might be a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. um, you have people that are consultants, so they'll go in and do the delivery, but they could call themselves a coach. So yeah, that's probably where the, the industry sometimes gets a bit of a bad rap because you have lots of people doing it in different ways. It's difficult to understand. Yeah. Like law is law. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't just call myself a lawyer. Mm -hmm. don't know what I'm doing. But in coaching, provided you've got somebody that is sat with somebody helping them become something that they're not right now, get better results than what they've got, you, you call yourself a coach. So, so then best get results. What are your, what do you consider to be the correct attributes for a business coach? It's, that's good. First and foremost, you've got to be able to ask the right question of the individual because I don't own your result, right? If I'm working with you, it's first and foremost, it's about helping you identify what it is that you're actually trying to create, helping you create a plan for that. I think I've got the answer to what makes person the best hmm. first and foremost you've got to have a community you can't do things on your own so you've got to be surrounded with great people the coach has to be able to hold people to account so if you suggest a course of action or a thing that you're going to commit to do a coach must be able to hold you to account to deliver that by whatever means necessary deemed by the individual mm -hmm. and the person doing the coaching. They've got to be results orientated. The result is the most important thing. And they've got to be able to educate you. So they've, there's, a, there's, a, there's a phrase in coaching which is, the coach always has to be a page in front. I have to be a book in front, but I have to know what's around the corner and be able to protect you from certain things. So community, accountability, results orientation and education. Groovy. Thanks, mate. <laughs> but yeah, my point was, <clears throat> sorry, my point was, um, I could be a motivational speaker and brand myself as a coach, right? Mm -hmm. Motivation by design is going to make somebody move quicker, mm -hmm. right? So do things faster, not necessarily better. So if you don't know what you're doing and I motivate you, you just end up doing stupid shit quicker. Right, so that could cause chaos, carnage. Mm -hmm. I think a great coach can help you navigate that path. Might not have, not have all the answers, but can go, hey, bro, are you sure you're making the right call here? You know, is there any other alternate movements we could be making? What's the benefit of what we're doing right now? Help you de-risk certain things. I don't think you can answer it in one sentence. I hope, hopefully I've given you some kind of answer. Hmm. Also, the, the best coach out there has the best client. Okay. Um, how many businesses in the UK now? A, a lot. Most mm -hmm. fail. 
Um, my job as a coach is to find great people and make them better. Can't polish a turd. Can you tell uh, or can you predict whether a business is going to succeed or fail based on the personality of its owner? Well, that's two different things, isn't it? You've got an idea of a business and then you've got an individual steering it. Yeah. Um, I think you've got to have both of those things. You could yeah. have a great individual with a <laughs> business that would make it better. Mm -hmm. You could also have a great idea run by a somebody that shouldn't be running it who wouldn't make that thing special. So it's a few things with business, isn't there? Who's running it? What's the idea? What's the mark? Just because it's a great idea doesn't mean there's a marketplace that wants to buy that idea. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a recipe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is there a market? Can we penetrate that market? What's the individual like? What's the business like? What's the track record saying? We have a, a checklist that we go through when we're working with somebody. Do these tick all the boxes? Okay, so when it comes to business owners, can mm -hmm. you say, can, in your like, do you have a little thing in your head to be like, this guy, no, it's not for him? Not for me. Not for me. So it's not, it's not for him. That person is just not for me. Mm. So there'll definitely be someone out there that will be able to help that individual. So you, th you think there's no one beyond help? There's no one beyond help provided they want to help themselves. And it's promising. And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> there is hope. Um, I, I sit with lots of people that I go, not it. Okay. It's not for, not for me. Yeah. And who's that? <clears throat> well, generally speaking, um, I work best with um, fast-paced, fast-orientated, people that want to move quick, mm -hmm. service-led, B2B. So if you if you got a B2B business that delivers a this is a sales pitch I'm looking straight at you. Um and you're fast paced and you want to you want to get results quick. That really floats my boat. Mm -hmm. I don't like spending much time in the gray. Um so when I meet somebody that that generally is younger people as well. So if you look at the majority of my clients they're 40 and below, they, they basically imi uh, imitate me, right? Mm -hmm, if I mm -hmm. look at the majority of my clients, they look and act like me, fast-paced, service-oriented, B2B, B2B business. Um, so when I meet somebody that doesn't match that, it's probably not going to float my boat. So if it doesn't float my boat, you're not going to get the best from me. So you shouldn't work with me. That's why I've got a team as well that are completely different to me, that offer different... Um, experience that deliver things in a different way because I certainly know I'm not for everybody. I'm not for the majority and I understand that as well. I can't help the majority. Very small minority, actually. Were there pivotal moments in your journey from being a business coach to being, you know, regarded as one of the best? Can yeah. you, what were those pivotal moments in that journey? Hiring, you see, for lots of coaches, it's, it's considered a bedroom business, right? So I could have done my business on my own from a bedroom on Zoom, right? So that's one route that you could take. Um, when, when I started this five years ago, um, I started with an idea, right, which is, we were talking about pride and ego off camera a little bit early on. So this could be ego. This could be pride. It could be a little bit of both. I really wanted to make an impact, right? So much deeper than me being at the top of a list really doesn't mean anything to me that. Um, in fact, when people talk to me about it, it just makes my toes, toes <laughs> curl. I was going to say something else, but that's for another day. Um, but what really matters to me is I want to make the city that I love great. And I love my city. And I want to be proud of it. Mm -hmm. I want to go into the city centre and go, from an egotistical perspective, I played my part in this. I helped them and them and them. And even if it was just you know, one conversation. So that's the first thing, right? So I had a driver behind it. So I knew I couldn't do what I wanted to do from my bedroom. 
mm -hmm. on Zoom. I knew I had to create a community and I couldn't do it on my own. Um, so when we set this up, we say, and I say we because I say it with my beautiful wife who keeps me in check. You know, she's probably the only person on planet Earth that can get me to change my mind on certain things. And say it with Ed, who's like Captain Spreadsheet that sits behind me, that helps me rationalize decisions. So we say it up together. Three soon became four, which became five, which became six, which became seven. And there's like 12, 12 13 of us now. Because um, that's what's required in order to make an impact in the community that we serve. And I believe I serve the community. My job is to serve the businesses within my community. So that was the first pivotal moment. One, having, I don't want to be Martin Luther King about it, but actually having a dream of creating the epicenter. I want people to go, Sheffield, oh, that's, if you want to be in business, you've got to move there. You just got to move there. That makes me tingle, you know? Um, and then understanding that in order for me to do that, I needed to have clients that really cared about that as well, that really cared about it. So probably 80% of my clients really give a shit about the city that we're in. And we're all on the journey together, doing it all together. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a pivotal moment, waking up, cold sweat, going, I want to do that. So you, so that's your vision is to make Sheffield better. Yeah. So by by, and is this is this can I make it sound better? Is this the, go on? So I want our business is there to impact a hundred thousand people's lives by twenty thirty. So we so want you, to impact a hundred thousand okay. people by twenty thirty. In order to do that, we need to successfully work with ten thousand small businesses in and around the Sheffield and City region. If we do that, ten by ten. We'll hit our mark. We'll impact 100,000 individuals from in and around the, the Sheffield and City region, which is about 20% of the population. And I'm a big believer that on the ripple effect. So if I can impact 20%, they can all impact 20%. It goes broader and goes wider. and Probably quite a hippie at heart. A bit hippie-like, you know. Hmm. So to swing the pendulum the other way from hippie, yeah. are you going to go into politics? Well, why? Because uh, it's a it, facade, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. So the very best possible human being, I'm not saying that you are that, but let's say the very best possible human being, being an MP of your fine city, mm. couldn't make it a better place. Politics is not for me. This is the best possible impact you can make. No. You asked me if I was going to go into politics, and the answer is no. You said that you cared about improving Sheffield. Right. Now, can I, I improve Sheffield in a different way than going into What's politics? the best possible impact? Bro, I'm not going to go to some chambers and wear some funky clothing. You know, I'm, I'm not a... Now, could I create a charity? Could you? Yeah, will I? Absolutely. Um, and that, I don't have to be involved in politics with that. No. I'm, for those of you that know me, you know I'm not a schmoozer. I can't... I'm not very good at schmooze. I'm a direct kind of guy so I wouldn't get in in politics I've, I, if I was an MP I think I'd leave those chambers a lot just get up and walk out mm -hmm. and go like what am I wasting my time here for I don't think there is yeah I think polit politics are, are a facade to keep people busy watching them I, I can't remember anybody from a political perspective having a real impact on on the community that I serve but yeah. I think business can I think business can change an economy I think the economy dictates the individuals that sets the lives up for so many people. Um, but you know, what's close to mine and my, my wife's heart is we want to we want to create something for the young and vulnerable in our city. You know, catch them early, right? And we'll do that in 2030. When my work in, in this is done, set the charity arm and give back to the community. Who I serve, right? How long? 2030. Five and a half years left and counting. Just a bit more than five and a half. Which makes me nervous because I've not done enough yet. So there are a lot of businesses in Sheffield in, and in... About ten and a half thousand, yeah. Is having a coach, a business coach, a definite positive impact? Yeah. I mean, any coach is a positive impact. Somebody to... <clears throat> Help you question your decision making. Um, it's not a prerequisite, right? So, 
there are talented people out there that are going to be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a necessity of success. It's not, it's not part of that equation. But a coach should be able to impact that individual in a positive way. So, yeah, it's definitely going to help. Generally speaking, all our coaches have owned and operated and exited their businesses successfully, which enables you to look at things from a different perspective, right? I view my path the same as all my clients. I'm on the same journey as them, right? I've got an exit strategy. I know when I'm done. I know the impact that I'm trying to create, and I fail in front of my clients all the time. So you could you could join as an employee business coach amongst the 200 or so franchises that operate here in the UK. You could buy a, a territory and become the owner of that. There are strict stipulations. It's not just turning up with a bag of money. You've got to pass a series of tests in order to be granted the rights to that said franchise. And they're the two ways in which you could do it. I don't think coaching can be taught uh, from a degree because you've got a BA in business. Business and admin degree. doesn't mean that you can necessarily coach. It is a skill. Mm. It is a skill. What makes a good entrepreneur? Ooh, what makes a good... On, well, define... Uh, what's your definition of entrepreneur? You first. Well, I should have asked you that one first. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks, mate. My definition of an entrepreneur is somebody that can turn an idea into money. It's a capitalist dream, isn't it? So they've got an idea and can turn it into money. Mm. And they've done that a multitude of times. Right, um, Elon Musk is a true entrepreneur. Sees opportunity, creates income from that opportunity. Mm-hmm. But just because you're a business owner mm-hmm. or you're self-employed, you you own a limited company, doesn't make you entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurialism is about going. I can make that work better. How can I make it yeah, work but better? The, Create it, and off you go. The guy running the bagel shop. He's, owner. he's a business owner, well, but he's still not an employee. He still went, you know what, I'll do that myself. Define employee. Someone that works for someone else. So I, I view employment as exchanging time for money. Yeah. I give you my time and I receive an income for that time. Ah, so you're going to say that guy's also still an employee? He just works for himself. Yeah, gotcha. He's an employee by himself. Mm-hmm. The guy running the bagel shop, if he stops making the bagel, what happens to the bagel shop? Mm-hmm. Entrepreneurs don't think that way. They go, okay, how can I make that work quicker? Who could I get to? Mm-hmm. All right? I think in leverage terms, not necessarily in, okay, I can buy this at £5 and sell it for £10. How many of those could I do? That's a job, isn't it? It doesn't mean that's a bad thing. You know, if you want to work for yourself, great, do that. Big believer in working for yourself than somebody else. It's what sets everything off. Mm-hmm. You know, more than more. I want more people to run businesses. The ones that make the cogs turn, not the politicians. But an entrepreneur is someone that does something a bit more than that. Being that they they've done it a multitude of times, they can see an idea and move it forward. That's entrepreneurialism. And you don't just work with entrepreneurs; you work with normal business owners as well. I I work with people that want more than what they've got. Yeah, I'm not a business coach for entrepreneurs. Otherwise, I'd be an entrepreneurial coach, not a business coach. I do like to so see wh- people that have got entrepreneurial... Some people have got entrepreneurial tendencies, but they don't necessarily... Be, they lack the belief to move on those things. I work with them. My job is to help them unpick and unlock that belief system. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the question yeah, of what right. makes a good business owner, right? I'll come, we'll come back to that. Okay. But I'm curious. From the position of someone who is employed, thinking about starting his own business mm. or, has. In, or has it's what did PC bro <laughs> what did they <clears throat> you're asking again what, uh, no okay <laughs> I was projecting because <laughs> I, I remember it being me I've got to remember the decibel difference <laughs> that we've got going on what um, what do they need to be thinking about it's it's not what you do it's how you do it to become right let's use the bagel shop is there a bagel shop out there? I don't know. I don't think so. I doubt hungry. it. Hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. Um, You're all hungry. Okay, so <laughs> um, if I'm thinking about owning a bagel shop, right? Mm-hmm. 
I have got to think about, if I'm going to be the business owner, the last thing I need to be thinking about is making bagels. I've got to think about the cornerstones of this business. Recruiting, sales and marketing, systems, finance. I master those. For, it's got nothing to do with a bagel. Hmm. Can I count the money up? Can I do a P&L? Do I know what a cash flow forecast is? Can I create one? What's my break-even analysis? And actually learning the finances of a business. How do I create a system, which is the reason why McDonald's is so good as a business model, to get the best bagel out the quickest so I can serve the most people? Mm -hmm. How can I create that operational infrastructure and system? How do I communicate that out to my marketplace through sales and marketing outreach? And how can I create a, a culture within this organization that people want to join? People talk about this bagel shop. You've got to work in it. These, these people are great. It's got nothing to do with bagels, has it? Mm. I spoke about how good a, I'm making a bagel. That's not the business. It's like um, I often say, if I was going to um, open a hairdressing salon, I'd get a mechanic to run it. Why? Because the mechanic can't cut hair or there'd be some you know, quirky haircuts in and around Sheffield. And if I was going to open a garage, I'd get the hairdressers to run the garage. Because they can't fix the car. They've got to think about how do they operate the business. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Most businesses struggle because the owner of that business is the technical direction behind it. Has to do the do. They're always doing the do. They're not growing and developing the business. Who's running the business? Whilst you're fixing the car or cutting the hair. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons why we got the coaching team. Because... I shouldn't just be coaching all the time. Who's running the business whilst I'm coaching? Very good. Four cornerstones of business. Emotional intelligence is a massive part of it as well. You're going to be able to get the best out of people. That's one of the questions that came from the internet universe. Oh. Is how it's interweb. Hang on, it's interweb. How important is uh, emotional intelligence? More in important than anything else. What is it? What are we talking about and why is it so important? The ability important? to understand human beings, what to ask and how to ask it and why to ask it. Um, being able to connect with an individual. Um, some people have it, natu natural emotional intelligence. You know, they'll walk into a room, they'll spot an individual and they go, are you, are you okay? Nobody else sees it, right? Mm -hmm. Then all right, can I help you with anything? They can give feedback well, they can, they're great communicators. That's a high degree of emotional intelligence. Not only are they aware of other people, but they're aware of themselves as well when they're out of balance and out of sorts a little bit. Ultimately, business is all about people. Right? If you're going to scale, you've got to have great people running great systems, delivering great products or services to your customers, and ultimately the customers put the money into the business where hopefully there's some left for the owner at the end of the year. So this is a philosophy... That's, that's, that says there's ethics in business. Well, there should be ethics in business. There is another uncomfortable philosophy yeah. that says ethics shouldn't be involved in business. Why? Because it's just business, it's not personal. You know that whole mafia stuff? Business is personal. It's terrifyingly, it? terrifyingly not true. Personal. Yeah. Everything start. a business always starts with somebody that cares. You know, talking about Musk, he wants to get, he wants to colonize Mars. Mm -hmm. I don't think he cares about that. But there are some businesses that operate quite unethically. Is that, are we talking about the minority here or are we talking about the majority? I don't know, there's some quite massive businesses that operate unethically. Depend, it depends on how you define ethics. We're going to spar now, aren't we? Let's, let's talk what you mean by ethical. Um, so that's an interesting point mm -hmm. because different if you go to different societies and different communities, ethics yeah. means something different. Right. But let's say taking over a part of Africa mm -hmm. and taking over its army and then shooting its people so you can operate oil from there. Yeah. Is that... <laughs> I, would de I would define that's that quite, as unethical. That's quite answer, unethical. Right? But again, it's quite large companies. Yeah. You know. Okay, so I'm going to define a category of business. So I deal with the SME marketplace right small to medium sized enterprises zero to 500 members of staff 99 percent are ethical organizations no doubt about it but that isn't that aren't what we're talking about here 
Isn't that politics? Or is that business? I don't know wh which point those two separate. Because when you've got uh, a multi, multi billionaire company and uh, a politician. They're definitely on, involved in politics. A politician on 60, 70 grand a year. Yeah. Uh, I can't see. Not anymore, brother. <laughs> yeah. Just, I don't know where those two separate. I don't separate. do politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I don't touch politics. I don't do the news. I don't do politics. The consequence, the penalty for good people not getting involved in politics is that bad people will lead them. It depends. I'd Plato, mush, it wasn't yeah, me. Yeah. I didn't say it. Yeah, look, I, I love the Greeks. <laughs> I love the Greeks. <laughs> it's, uh, do you believe there's only so many battles one person can fight? Or do you think I sh they should fight them all? Well, I, I do believe in picking your battles, right. if that's what you mean. Like, so I'm picking my battle. Yeah, that's fair. I'm good at that. I know I'll, I'll, I'll not be great at that. Mm. I don't want to turn, you know, open the curtain and go, look at this shit show. don't think that'll go damn well in the political chambers, would it? I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, politics is not for me. Seems like yeah. a lot. Of, it seems like it's, a lot of deliberation. It's not for a go, lot of go back, people. That I, I want to act. Let me talk. You ask the question. Let me give the answer. The thing is, <clears throat> right? you want me to get into politics. I'm not getting into politics. No, it's not that I want you to get into politics necessarily, but you want you more. Probably should. Yeah, that's the problem. And leadership. There's another thing about leadership that it. You know, some people have it thrust upon them. And they, you know, they just like avoid it at all costs. No, it's not for me. It's not for me. Yeah. It's not for me. And you're like, no, actually, mate. You're the one we need. So for for those right. Um I have a blunt force trauma approach to coaching, right? Yeah. If I can say it in two words, I'm gonna say it in two words. I'm I'm certainly not gonna get the thesaurus out and think about how eloquent can I sound whilst I'm about to deliver the message that I'm about to deliver. Mm. If I can get it across in ten seconds, great, let's get it across in ten seconds and move on. The amount of times that I would say bullshit. To a client, bullshit, telling me bullshit, you are chatting absolute How's that going to go down in political political spheres? So then the question is, well, I'm prepared to change who I am to fit in with a crew that I don't want to fit in with. No, I pick my battle. I want to deal with a small to medium-sized business owner that wants to change the world. Together we can, mm. regardless of what they're doing in their funny robes over there. Politics is not for me. Don't watch the news. Not interested in politics. Yeah, I, don't. I will not be voting whenever it is. Oh, here we go. Not me. Mm. Sorry, my man. No, Nothing. no, well, no, you're right, fine. I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if this makes me look... Well, I don't watch, I try to avoid the news. Yeah, don't do it. I can't stand it. <laughs> I can't stand it. I like a peaceful life. Yeah. And that just adds... I have a belief around news. Anxiety. Eventually I'll find out. <laughs> so I'm not going to waste my time watching it. If it's something really important that's going on, I'm, I'm going to find out about it. You know, Dave on the street is going to tell me. All right. So let me ask you this question yeah. then. You happy? Define happiness. What do you define as okay. successful? I would say I'll, I would, uh, two questions. Yeah, yeah. Right, so am I happy? I'm always happy. Could That's I be good. happier? Yeah. Am I content? No. Certainly not content. Look, I, 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 I hit the jackpot, right? I've got a beautiful wife. I've got two beautiful daughters. I've got three beautiful daughters. Um... My niece, my daughter, I consider her to be my daughter. So I have three beautiful daughters. I've got a dog that snores. Uh, you know, I love where I live. I love my neighbors. But I'm not finished. I've got a lot more to do. So am I happy? Yes. But I'm not content. And I'm not finished. What was your next question? Define success in business. Define success. Achieving the goal that you originally set out to achieve. So I have this concept. 
when I'm when I first work with a client, we'll generally spend half a day together, and the idea is there's some pre work to do and all that kind of jazz, but it's to say right, we're going to define what great is, and we're going to head in that direction. What's the north star? What's the top of the mountain look like? So somebody might go, look, I want a business that works without me, that pays me a hundred grand a year, that employs great people, pays above what market rate is, and that's their version of success. Another person that goes, I want to take over the world. Who's more successful? Person that wants a hundred grand a year to impact in their community, but not exchange time for money anymore, or the person that turns a, an idea into a gazillion pounds? Mm. Who's more successful? Success is about defining what you want, going out and getting it, trusting your instincts, taking on the education, doing what's required. Provided you travel that journey, that's success, right? So then how do you define the success for yourself? For me, mm. achieving our vision. Impact the lives of 100,000 people in the Sheffield and City region. By doing that, we've got to impact 10,000 companies by 2030. If we don't do that, we fail. So if you knew, this is the question I asked you before. If I knew. Oh, yeah. I said I've got a good answer for this. Yeah. If you knew uh, that no matter how hard you work, you'd get the same amount of money. You don't know how much money that is, by the way. Mm -hmm. But no matter how hard you work, you'd get the same amount of money. This is the Islamic principle of risk, yeah. right? So you get the same reward. So the idea, by the way, behind this principle is that you live fearlessly, right? And also you don't allow money to corrupt you because there's no point cutting corners because you're still mm. going to get the same goal. But you are still obliged to work, but you'd still get the same amount of money. What would you do? Definitely be still community oriented, no doubt about it. Um, big believer that you bring people together and things happen. Um, probably run a community centre, you know. Probably run a community centre. I always remember being young, right? I was a bit of a... Um, I, n I never broke the law, but I certainly bent it as far as I could possibly take it. I always remember that there was some really good people around you that would kind of go, are you sure? Are you sure you're not better than this? I think the younger are impressionable with stuff like that. And I'm mm. really fortunate that I had some people that was like, you know, tapping me on the shoulder going, you're better than that. So if I could impact the younger generation to go, you, you can be whatever you want, you know, but, but start to define it, start to consider it. That's, I'd love to do something like that. I don't think that'll pay the mortgage. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's what we're considering doing yeah, 2030 yeah. onwards, you know, that's when we'll give back. Hmm. You know? Now, when I was younger, I had a, I had a vision that by... By 40, I'd be retired, be retired. And I'd do the job that I want to do the most. When mm. I was younger, I wanted to be a builder. Right? I just wanted to build things. I wanted to look around and go, oh, I built that. I always saw like builders in summer, mm -hmm. tops off tanning, thinking, I could do with a bit of that, <laughs> do with a bit of that. that. Waned over time. I remember being in class in junior school and seeing the gardener on that, Hell of a mower. Yeah. Thinking that's the dream. I didn't spend much time in class. <laughs> that was my problem. Bad student. Or poor teachers. Depends on how you look at it. I think you a student me. is only good as the person teaching them. Mm. Um, I'm use that against you. <laughs> <laughs> try it. But it's true, isn't it? Everybody's a great student provided they've got the right teacher. I was mm. a great student in certain certain classes. Mm. I'm, um, I'm a kinesthetic learner, though. I learn by doing, right? So and I think the education system isn't great for people that, you know, want to do things because mm -hmm. they get itchy, itchy feet. You've probably seen me. I've done this about 14 times already. Um, so it didn't suit me well, I don't think, school. I was the guy at the back making the pair open play and throwing it at people. Not because I was trying to be... Um, 
my school report always said if John applied himself, if he applied himself, mm. and and it just wasn't floating my boat. Like I was the one just throwing the paper airplane, going, "Hey, that was funny, wasn't it?" But put me in PE and I'll perform because it was physical exertion, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to win. I was a competitor. Um, I remember for years when people asked me about my GCSE results, I used to say I got an A. Mm. <laughs> I actually got an A in P. What was the other one that I got two A's and the rest was D across the board. What do you think I got another A in? Woodwork. No. Have you seen me put up a shelf? <laughs> it was drama. Oh, here we go. So amateur dramatics. <laughs> I loved that. Because I love the idea of a story and playing a part in a story. I could quite get into that. So yes, story and, and physical exertion because it was all doing things. I didn't realize that until after. So if you're a, if you're a visual learner, I learn by seeing things. Or if you're an auditory learner, I learn by hearing things. School's great for you. Mm. Kinesthetics, they're going to find that difficult because they all they want to do is be busy, do something. If you want to learn geography, let's go travel somewhere. History, take me to a museum. Like, don't make me read a textbook and have to listen to you. You know? Mm. So I, d- I don't think the school system is really set up for the high, ma- not the high, ma- the low majority people. And what can be considered class clowns. I think if you look at a lot of those people, they've generally gone into not an academic uh, way of work. I've got a couple of questions from the internet. Oh, please do. <coughs> All right. This is a sad one to start with. Oh. Oh. How do you address <coughs> isolation and loneliness of being a business owner? Uh-huh. Hire some people. It doesn't have to be a lonely place. Why are you choosing to be alone? Okay. When do you hire someone? Because I've just started. Yeah. I've just started the business. It's yep. ticking over. It's making a reasonable amount of money. And thanks very much. I've well, what does bo- the plan say? <laughs> When are you going to hire somebody? Well, you tell me when I should, because my plan says I've got to wait for a year's salary. Why? Well, because that's what I wrote in my plan. So now what should I do? When well, do I hire? That all comes down to defining the value, right? So um, I'm a big believer. If I've got three months salary, and this is nothing new, I've told all my clients this, this is my rule. That shouldn't be your rule. If a, if a year's salary is your rule, great. My job is to ask you, why a year's salary? For risk is averse. Be, okay, so how risk averse? A how, year's salary worth? <laughs> how would you know it when that person was performing in that role how long would it take you to work that out it's mm, a good question right so if if you knew that person was performing should they be bringing in income or creating time for you to be able to create income so if mm. they performed in their role and that freed up time for you to create income would you need them to do that for a year for that for that to work out my rule is three months mm. I've got three months salary one, that's stopping me generating income, right? Because if I'm in delivery mode too much, I'm not in income generation mode. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I've got three months salary, that's, that's enough. No? Uh, this, by the way, if you're feeling isolated, you know, do something about that. There's so many co-working spaces now. Um, that's why they're so cool, right? So I can go into an environment, go to networking, go to free events. I have to be, a, I'm talking to camera, I'm, like, I'm talking to the person who ever, whoever asked that question, but like, come to one of my events, man. I run four free events every single year. Just, you know, to harness your skills, get better. Come for free. I even feed you. Come on. <laughs> Don't be lonely. Do you have a lot of friends in the business? I don't have friends. I have acquaintances. It's interesting. I don't have many friends. My wife's my best friend. My kids are my friends. My brother, my father, my mum. What do you see? My dad once said to me, this probably, probably comes from him. He said, when you're older, you'll be able to count your friends on one hand and the high yeah. majority of those will be your family. Yeah. He was burnt and he passed that on to me. Mm-hmm. So I think I've always had that ember at the back of my mind that provided I take care of my wife and my kids and my close family, I'll be all right. And he served me well to now. I have lots of people that I would class as acquaintances of mine. Are you do, are you doing are you creating a, just a, a semantic barrier? Define what you mean by. Or semantic were you just barrier? like no, they're not friends, but they actually are well, for if, all intents if, and purposes. Well, I what love you do, my what, clients. What, what, what? That doesn't make them my friends. I don't mean clients. Oh, who what are you, you talking about then? What do you what do you would you class as a friend? 
What does what does it mean to you? The word. Oh, that's good. I don't know. Because you don't want to know. You're like maybe. No, no friend to you. <laughs> like friend, somebody that's your pal, somebody that's you know a, a pleasure to be around or not sometimes, but someone that's right oh, or I'm die. Don't tell my friend if it's not a pleasure to be around. Sometimes, I don't want to be around that. Some person. people can, <laughs> but they, you still love them and you still every I, now and I, I want to be around some <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. That sounds cool. That sounds like <laughs> sometimes that, you know that sounds like I need that <laughs> sometimes. But you know, a ride or die partner. It's my wife. Ride you or know, die. you've got no pals that you would be like. Okay. You sound like my wife. <laughs> like go go get some friends, man. I'm like you're my friend. <laughs> All right, cool. I have a. Like, I would do a lot for. Every, right, okay. If you if you break, everyone's my friend. Yeah. I think you might find out that that's more true than you think. Yeah, I think, uh, you think everyone's you have, my friend. I think if you can get away from the, your past traumas... There's no bad past you've traumas. Got, you've got more I'm friends. My dad impacted. <laughs> you've got more friends I'm, than you I'm know. your only friend, that guy. Um, I think it's more about... So I, can, I, can I say the word client before you start saying, yeah. don't talk about clients? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. <clears throat> I can't be your friend. I can be your unreasonable friend. But sometimes, you know... I have to m create that barrier where my job is to get you a result. Mm -hmm. My job is to take you from where you are to where you want to go. Sometimes, I, you know, it's not about being friendly with somebody. Yeah, I mean... There's a, I th but also, there's, there's a difference a time, between being friendly and being a friend. There's a time and a place as well. Like, if um, if we're in the middle of doing a thing, you know, even if you're with your friends, we're doing a thing, we've got to get the thing done. And if, yeah. you're, if you're... I'm your, clearly your friend then, because we're doing a thing. Okay, I haven't done this thing for anybody else. Friend, everyone, yeah, it is. Done this thing for anyone. I haven't even really done this for my wife. I'm your first friend. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Lucky boy. It's, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's another one. Bloody hell, they're all sad. Oh, okay. Come on. Are there common regrets about personal <sighs> sacrifices made for the sake of business success? Shall I read that again? Yeah, because I started thinking about regret. Because I have a view on regret, but go on. Well, let's do your bit first, because I've got this written down. Well, I think human beings are... Our DNA from thousands of years, right, is we're all still like cave people, living in the cave, worried about the bear. <laughs> mm. Stay in the cave, stay in the cave. And I think that's how our brain is programmed. You're talking about people that are risk-averse. Everybody is risk-averse mm. until they take a risk and they go, hold on a minute. That shit really worked. Mm -hmm. I'll do more of that. But the majority of people don't take the risk, right? And I think that's because of how we're programmed. We try and avoid pain at all costs. My view is pain is inevitable. But you have to, you've got a choice of which one you want. You can either have a pain of self-discipline, which is doing what you know you should do, or the pain of regret. Not doing it. Mm -hmm. And I have the view, like, do I want to be the old the old guy in the old people's home going, you know what? If I'd have done mm -hmm, telling mm -hmm. the war story mm -hmm, of the guy mm -hmm. that's never been in the war, or do I want to die a bit younger but go into the grave at 70 miles an hour on fire going, what a ride. I want to be that guy, right? So the reason why I'm fairly pro-risk, my, my team have kittens with me. Right? We're in the middle of going... We've got two offices right now. Um, we've outgrown them, right? The business model and, and the office situation, they don't go hand in glove anymore. So we're trying to find larger offices. Now, my brain goes, we need something to grow into. So we're looking at things 7,500, 9,000 square foot. That's a big space. And I'm going, be all right, we'll fill it. Be all right, we'll work it out. Ed's behind me going, spreadsheet, spreadsheet, spreadsheet. Cheryl's going, you're a maniac. But deep down, I know that I'll fill it. If I create the vacuum, it, it'll be all right. I've done the calculus. I'm not, mm. <laughs> to use your term, I'm not <laughs> I know what I'm doing. I know the vision that I'm trying to create, but everything that, I make every decision based on 10,000 people, 10,000 businesses. If I want to impact 10,000 businesses, I can't do that from a crummy office. It's not a crummy office, it's a great office. On Sydney Street, which can only fit four, five, six people in coaching clients at a mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. Or do I need something on three floors that's going to have a massive impact on the city? I need that. Mm -hmm. Give me the bigger boat. Give me a bigger boat. How did I get there? Regret. That's mm. why. So regret 
It's a pain, isn't it? Or, or self-discipline. I want to be the guy that was disciplined enough to go, let's do it. What's the worst that can happen? I say, sorry. Gave him my best. Cool. What was the question? The question was, so are there common regrets? Are there common regrets that people express about personal sacrifices that they have made for the sake of business success? Okay, so I actually listened to this time. <laughs> Uh, I heard the question. We've edited out all the other versions about, of it. They didn't know. I made it all about f me, didn't I? <laughs> um, yeah, the biggest regret is time. Say more things. Um, more things. Mm. Um, they wish they'd have done things sooner. Okay. They wish they'd have not lost time with loved ones. There is always a better way, isn't there? Mm. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't enable you to be a time traveler. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big believer. Like, learn by other people's mistakes. The blueprint is in front of you. And there'll be lots of people that will offer you some advice and guidance along the way. Um, so I set this business off in, in that guise, right? So I've got kids. I didn't want to be the guy that has to go at work at six, not get back till 10, kiss my kids on on the head good night and hopefully my wife's left me a space and I didn't want to be that guy I say are we rigid I, I, I believe discipline is the thing that enables you to uh, not avoid regret but stop regret from happening be disciplined to do what's required so I take my kids to school every morning every morning I pick my youngest up because my eldest don't have anything to do with me <laughs> I pick my youngest up every Friday and we have family Friday right I don't work before nine. I don't work after five. That's my rule. Because before nine o'clock is my time. And, you know, like home alone. You, uh, that's like our house in the morning. Can't get the kids out of bed. Just like two more minutes, two more minutes, two more minutes. Um, and then after after five is I want to be family time. I want to have husband time. And I want to have dad time. Not in that order. Family dad, husband. Mm. And then if there's anything left, I'll have some left for me, but I know I've got mine in the morning. But yeah, the common regrets are I should have done something sooner. You've got to sometimes trust your intuition a little mm -hmm. bit, right? You think from your gut as well as your head. It's an actual thing. You think from your gut. So if your intuition is saying, should do that, do it. What's the worst that could happen? If it goes wrong, you start again? Well. Go on. Some people perceive business as a risky endeavor. So he's not doing it though, isn't it? Same risk. Well, everybody starts with that. Well, what if, what if it goes wrong? Yeah. Well, what if it doesn't? It's 50-50. It's not 50-50. Why not? No, the statements are 50-50 if they were written on the side of a coin. It's not 50-50. Fair. <laughs> no, the, the problem is, is people, and, and so my, my, and this is something I, uh, I say, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm right because I'm not a business coach. Yeah. yeah. Right? Should but be, though. What I say yeah. is that <clears throat> the, the perceptions of risk are misunderstood. Right? So I was, I'm not, not, I wasn't necessarily disruptive, but on my journey in through law, for example, I was very curious as to why certain people were employed. Like, I couldn't understand it. They were personable. They brought in loads of business. They were cracking at the job. I'm like, well... You seem to have all the, all the attributes necessary to do this for yourself. You bring in the work and you do the work well. Why aren't you at least working for yourself? Yeah. Right? And so I was trying to figure it out and, and risk was one of them. Like, you know, and I was like, well, it doesn't make sense. You're working quite hard, quite intelligently for 10 to 15 hours a day. Surely I could give you anything. And if you work for 10 to 15 hours a day in a disciplined, intelligent way over a period of like f five, six days a week, what can't you achieve? You know, any business. The, the Not just proving my point. Yeah, and well, that is the point. That is, the, <clears> that's <throat> what I'm saying. I think that the, there's a misunderstanding of the risk. Like, but the the risk of I'm employed right now. Mm -hmm. I'm, yes, I have proved your point. I'm employed right now. It's and, annoying, isn't it? And my mortgage is paid. <laughs> yeah. Versus I start this, I screw it up, and it won't get paid. Okay, so how much do you need to save in order to start? What's the worst? 
Like if you started a bit, doesn't need capital outlay, right? So most business startups doesn't don't need that much capital outlay, right? So it takes a bit of time. My belief is you can't do things half-heartedly. Mm. You either do it or you don't, mm -hmm. right? And if you're not prepared to take the leap, don't take the leap. Um. So yeah, don't do things by half. So either do it or or do it or don't, right? But if there's that urge in inside of you going, oh, I want to do this thing. Do it. Provided there's no capital outlay, the only thing that you've got to invest is time. Well, how long before you go, shit, this thing's not working? Mm. So what are your options? If you if you did this, right, okay, you go from working in a legal practice to starting your own. Well, my, my options are slightly different, perhaps. Perhaps the risk is slightly less well, what you terrifying. Why? Why? Give uh, me an idea of somebody that wants to start a business. Well, maybe, s well, somebody that isn't me. Let's choose somebody else that isn't me. Don't talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I, I <coughs> put myself in a position where risk really wasn't on the radar. Yeah. So my ha my house was something I could afford if I worked in a warehouse. Right. So th okay, but you know, the worst I, I case scenario that, is you, you stop the business, you start the job. You go back. Yeah, but jobs aren't that easy to find for everyone. Yes, they are. There we are. There we go. Yes, they are. Are they? Yeah. This is a fallacy? Fallacy. All right, there we go. You Should I tell it, you I got my you first job? First. Go on. I, told, I got told I wasn't going to get the job. And I went, all right, I'll see you Monday. What was that? What job they was went, that? They went, I didn't get the job. <laughs> and they went, I said, okay, I'll see you Monday. And they said? But you don't have the job. And I said, well, I'll keep on turning up until you give me one. And they said, all right. Have you... Do you want to look up stalker in the dictionary? <laughs> but I went to it. I said, I'm here. I'm ready. Regardless of you giving that person, I'm going to be here. And I'm going to prove that it's me that deserves this job. Yeah, I like it. Now, I'm not saying act with that much mentalness. But if you take a little bit of that, could you find a job? Yeah, of course you could. If there's something in you going, I should start this business. Look, bit, bits and bobs. First and foremost... Every council or every city will have some kind of enterprise hub, which offer free advice. Go say, book an appointment, book a sick day or book a holiday. Book a holiday day, don't lie. Book a holiday. Go in to see some local enterprise centre and say, hey, I've got this idea, what do you think? And they'll say, I think it's good or I think it's shit, or stay in work. But yeah. there's, there's a, if there's an itch, scratch it. Scratch the itch. Yeah, regret self discipline. Do you know? Are you gonna Are you gonna be sat in the old people's home and go? Oh, my life was absolutely capitulated because I took an idea to work for myself. Mm. Or are you gonna go? I really wish I'd done had a go at that thing. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm with you. But it's not for everybody, and the majority of us fail. But define failure. I don't, but, but maybe this is my belief set, right? Because I don't believe in failure. Mm. I think it's a fallacy. It's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. You either win or you learn, don't you? Okay, yeah. that didn't work. Not do that again. I'll do it differently next time. Shift. You know, I can find loads of different ways of not mm. how, how not to do things. Believe you me, I've learned a lot of them. Try that. That did not work. I'll not do that again. Most people would view that as failure. Yeah. I look at that as, okay, lesson learned, move on. Mm -hmm. Something else. And the best do that really mm -hmm. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have seen that. Uh, that Stephen Bartlett well. talks about that. They celebrate their failures that week. Mm. Right? So they all talk about them openly. Because yeah. he fail understands fast. it. Fail fast. Fail forwards. Correct. Yeah, Learn yeah. from it, move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if anybody's got a business idea that they, you know, they want to set up a business and they're not sure, send me an email and I'll tell you whether I think it's any good or not. But f what do I know? Okay, so how prevalent is imposter syndrome? And it's what impact? Here's the it's in every one of us, isn't it? We've um, all got it. What impact does it have on decision making mm. and leadership? It depends on how you choose That's to amplify it. Question. Um, well, sometimes it's not an imposter. Sometimes it's reality, mm -hmm. right? To go, 
you should not be doing this. Like if I say, uh, I'm going to sign up to the Olympics today and I'm going to go for gold on the 100 meeting, uh, 100 meters. Mm-hmm. My imposter or my reality check will go, bro, <laughs> invest your time in you something do some else. Push-ups. Like, do some push-ups. Just, no, no, just, <laughs> just invest your time somewhere else. It's not going to happen, chief. You're too old, you're too fat. Your knees are... <laughs> oh, I'm going to keep swearing, sorry. It's all right. Um, I'm at that stage in my life with I'm, I am who I am. Yeah, do um, you? Do you? They, they, they'll bleep it. It's fine. Um, so, sometimes it's not the imposter. Sometimes it's a reality check. Like, dude, don't do that. Mm. So the, the the real question is, well, how do you sense check in between? Is this my imposter going mm, mm-hmm, versus mm-hmm. reality going, dude? Don't do that. Mm-hmm. And the way that I look at it is, if I'm already on a course, if I'm, if I'm already on the ship in a certain direction, and something's telling me to slow down or speed up, I've got to be aware of it first. And I've got to ask myself the question, How did where did that thought come from? What is it asking me? What's my step forward? Should I listen to it or not? So it's about being conscious with that, right? So I'm going to become a 100 meter gold medalist. No, you shouldn't. Mm, okay, so where's that thought come from? It's probably because you're fat and old, bro. Okay. Is it heading me? Is this based on the direction that I'm going on? No, this is a complete U-turn because I'm a business coach. Mm-hmm. All right, so what should I do with the information that I've just took in? Maybe stick to what I'm good at. Mm-hmm. All right? If, you are, if, if I'm going, right, okay, use the building as an example. Right? Let's, sign, let's get a really big building. My imposter goes, yeah, but what if all goes wrong? Mm-hmm. And I'll go, okay, so does that increase my risk? Yeah, yeah, it does. So they might be on they might be on something. Okay, so what's the benefits of doing that? Mm, well, it allows me to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay, so do the benefits outweigh the risks? Yeah. Do I have any alternatives? Yeah, I could go for a smaller building, which won't cost me as much money. Okay, is that better than my original decision? Probably not. It's my intuition telling me I should be doing. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. What do I need to do next? Listen to Spreadsheet Boy. Make sure my wife is in charge of the budget. (laughs) So it's about consciousness. Taking that subconscious thought person, which is only yourself, by the way, Mm -hmm. and going, okay, so let's raise this awareness. Can I talk about competency? Um, four levels of competency. I'm sure I must have spoken yeah, to yeah, this, you this before, right? So yeah, yeah. imposter pops in at certain parts, right? So level one competency is I am unconsciously incompetent, right? I have no idea whether I'm good or bad at something. Mm-hmm. Level two competency is conscious incompetence. And now I'm astutely aware I'm at something. I may as well just say beep, haven't I? Uh, level three, conscious competence. I can now do something, but I have to be conscious with it. Level four, I'm unconsciously competent. I just do, right? So if you look at that on a... Um, what story? Do I, I normally use the uh, person driving a car story, mm-hmm. right? So zero to 10, 15 years old, I see cars driving around on the street. I am unconsciously incompetent. Mm-hmm. I don't know how these things work. I get in the back of them. They go from A to B. I see them driving around. Driving lesson number one takes me from unconscious incompetence to consciously incompetent. Mm. I'm I'm now astutely aware. I'm going to die. They're going to die. Something's going to go down. Right. Mirror signal maneuver listening to this. I've got to check my, I've I've got to do this thing. I've got to use these two feet all at the same time. I'm consciously incompetent. Imposter sets in. Mm -hmm. You can't do this, bro. Take the keys out, chief. Right, but my question is, is this pushing me forward? Mm-hmm. Is this taking... Yes, it is. Okay, so what do I have to do? I have to swap up, and I have to go from consciously incompetent to consciously competent. What do you, what's the only way to go from incompetence to competence? Activity. Mm-hmm. I've got to do more. Right, so generally, if you've got an imposter talking to you, do more. Search for more answers. Don't stop. Otherwise, nobody would ever drive if they listen to their, their imposter. Mm-hmm. First thought that most people have on, on their driving lesson is, I can't do this. You get to driving test stage, conscious competence. 
right? So I have to think about what I'm doing. I have to be conscious about what I'm doing. I have to know that there's somebody there and I have to look at this mirror. Even if I'm not doing it for anything other than for effect, I have to look at my mirror so I can show this person I know what I'm doing. Really deep down, I'm nervous as hell. And then you get to level four. And I'll ask the question, how did you get here today, brother? Mm-hmm. No idea, you just drove, didn't you? You just drove. So there are, and it seems to, and I don't know why, I, I suppose somebody can explain it, but it seems to be, it seems to affect women more than men. No. Well, wait for it, wait for it. Wait no! For it. no I, I'm sure I've read Women are okay to share this Maybe stuff. that's true. But there are people who are unconsciously competent, mm-hmm. as in really good at what they do, yeah, yeah. but still have this feeling that they don't belong in the role they're in. So you'll still have this insecurity that they are, that others are better better suited at the role than them, even though they're probably the best in the room. I, I just think, generally speaking, um, the female of the species is a far more open. They share book. more. That's a really yeah, interesting man. They, way sh- to they put share. It, they talk it? about things. Have you never been into a room full of women? They all sit around in a circle and talk about this stuff. You need to look at the Australian Get Men Talking campaign. I love this, right? So the way that women communicate is they, they sit around and look at one another. I mean, this is case in point. Look at how we're sat. Women wouldn't be sat like that. They'd be sat at each other. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we got to talk to this dude over here just to make it, right? So women openly share and discuss things and seek um, counsel mm. and are open to discussion. Men are men. So what they did in, in Australia is they built loads of sheds right, and openly um, invited men to bring things to fix, to get men talking for mental health. Because what they realized was m- men don't talk about problems, right? Mm-hmm. They like to fix sh- stuff, beep, whatever, right? <laughs> so th- what they got is they got loads of lonely men to take things like a lawnmower in. You'd have four dudes... Looking around, looking at this lawnmower, and one goes, okay, I'll bring a wrench, I'll bring a screwdriver, right, I'll bring this, this looks good. And they brought it back, and as they were fixing something, mm. they started talking about stuff, right? So women and men are completely different. Women are open sharers, will talk about things. My wife, on the, on the way over him from here, we were talking about uh, a problem. I, I'm in my head, right, thinking about that. She's an open, talks about stuff. That's, so... This whole men, women, imposter syndrome, probably women just talk about it more. And men goes, no, I'm man, I'm good. That's probably true. Be more woman. Probably <laughs> the out, output from that. What are some fears that you think business owners hide from the public, or from themselves? Finances are a big one that most people hide. Um it's denial, convincing yourself that something is better than what it actually mm-hmm. is. There's nothing better to look at in your business to tell you whether you're doing well or not. Balance sheet, profit and loss, and cash flow. Don't right if your cash flow is go, if you the flow of cash is diminishing, if your profit and loss is getting worse, and your balance sheet is depleting. Don't avoid that, right? Mm. That's certain certain demise. So yeah, the numbers will tell you everything. Because they don't lie, right? They just tell the truth at all times. I trust True. numbers. That's what Ed says. Spreadsheet, don't lie to me. <clears throat> From your perspective, what deep-seated motivation drives people to be entrepreneurs? Or is it just so varied? Yeah, well, everybody's got their own reason, haven't they? Um, but everybody starts with an entrepreneurial seizure. Everybody starts by having that wake-up moment going, I'm going to do this for myself. No more. Not working for that idiot anymore. I'm going to do this for myself. They start working for a lunatic. Um, everybody's got a different driver for that, though. Everybody's driver's different, right? Mm. Some, some <clears throat> person might want to run the best Italian restaurant in the world. Other people want to change the economy. Other people want to bring artificial intelligence to the world. Other people want to colonize Mars. Everybody does it for a reason, but normally there's th- there's a purpose behind it. Everybody should know why they're doing this. That's an important question. Yeah. 
probably the most important. To know why you're doing what you're doing. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because it's going to mean that you... I have those set rules, nine till five, right? But I'll outwork anybody in those hours. Anyone. Let's go. So that's my purpose, right? In order for me to do what I do, stick to the boundaries, dad, work, dad, husband, John time, I've got to outwork everybody. Otherwise, wh why would I stretch out an eight-hour day into, into 14? If we can do it in eight, let's do it in eight. Mm -hmm. So you look at my diary, I'm back to back, back to back to back to back to back, nine till five every single day other than Friday. It's where I pick my children up from school. That didn't answer the question. What was the question? From your perspective, what deep-seated motivations drive people to be entrepreneurs? And you said the des it's probably very. desire. It's probably the desire for more. It's probably the desire for more. Mm. I'm worth more. I can deliver more. And then that entrepreneurial seizure, I'm going to do this. Hey, if... Uh, World ended today. Mm. You go up oh, to the pearly gates. Does he have gate. to? You, the, you go up to the pearly gates. <coughs> Would he be happy with you? Or she? If you want to be PC. Would he be happy with you? My initial answer was, I would hope so. But I thought, why hope? What in me is saying, I need hope in order to answer that question. Maybe because I'm British. Humility's fine. That's probably what it is. What's wrong with that? I would hope so. I would hope so. I'm proud of what I've accomplished so far. Good man. But there's a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. That'll make me happy. So yeah, I would hope so. Groovy. As long as you're driving in the right direction. That's, see, you are I don't know whether I believe in the pearly gate thing, but anyway, that's another story yeah, for another do. day. I don't know whether I do. I'm not an atheist. You're going to play the semantics thing again. You're going to believe the in semantics. karma or the universe or, you know, it's, it's just semantics. I'm sure I've showed you, shared my philosophy on all this. I think this is hell, bro. That is dark. I don't think it is. What's the point? <laughs> what, what, what's hell about it? Why isn't it paradise? Because it's not. This is not paradise. This is a tough gig. But it's still wonderful. And it's what, in how own... Could it be wonderful? How could it be so full of so much wonder if it's hell? It c could it be capable of being both? Should we do that? Maybe. Where there's light, there's dark. Where there's dark, Why there's light. Why do you say this is hell? <clears throat> um, that's my belief. I think it's it's a tough... This is a tough world that we live on. It's tough. It's certainly not paradise. I'll go there today. We've done this already. Yeah. I don't know. Whenever you do this, right? And I, it makes me think of that. I don't know that song that you sent me. You know, how, what's the point yeah, of yeah. looking looking for the paradise in the yeah. sky if you can't find the one that you're on? Yeah, I, I like that line. Yeah. But it just... Because, yeah, there is a lot of darkness. And there is a lot of darkness. But every time you like, if you just stand outside and look out over a river or just look into your kid's mm -hmm. face when it's doing something goofy, and you're like, that's just magic. So where do you, yeah, I get that. <clears throat> On Monday morning, I want to view an office, right? I'll not say what it was. It was in the middle of the city centre. So we go view the office. Some good stuff about it, some work that's needed. And I, I, when I walked out of the car park, there was three homeless people, right? All hudged up together. And my wife only saw one. I said, there was three guys there, all hudged up together, covered. My first, res my first thing was, I don't want that office. My second thought was, because I don't want to be res the person responsible for throwing them away, throwing mm. them out of there. My third thought was, why didn't I do anything to help? I was too busy thinking about the office. Imagine what they that could have helped that person somehow, possibly, maybe. But which one do I choose? Which path do I choose? That's a hellish thought for me. So now I've lived the what what day am I on? What day is it? What day is it? Wednesday? Tuesday? Tuesday. 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 So I've lived there with that for like thirty odd hours. Should I have done something more about it? Of course that? you should have. 
is the answer. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, man. I should have done some mention there. Yeah, always. Yeah. Do you always? No. Now, did I should do you? something by did going, you? I don't want that office because I don't want to trick those That's dudes? Not the something. That's not the correct something. What, what, would it, what, would, what should I have done? I was should, late for a so meeting. So should <laughs> is different from what will you do, right? Because <coughs> you can't, it, it, well, I don't, I can't, obviously. It's difficult. Interesting. You can't do On something this, every oh, time. How Go weird on. is this, right? Same day I was uh, linked in. Hmm. What's the right term for being on LinkedIn? Um, I was Facebooking. I was linked in. I was on LinkedIn, right? Hmm. And I saw a charity that looked after the young and vulnerable in the Sheffield City Centre and reached out to somebody very same day. Good one. I didn't put those two things together at the time, but I understand now. Mm. Sorry, I had a brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the, yeah, the art, should you always do the right thing? Yes. Mm. Do we always? No. So would he be happy with me or she be happy with me? Probably not, no. They go, bro, well, what about those three guys? Well, I mean, it is an interesting mm. question to ask about the human condition that when you're a child, when you first see a homeless person, it breaks your heart. Mm. It really breaks your heart. Yeah, my kids didn't understand it for so long. Yeah, yeah. It, I, it, uh, it was why is this? Do you do you remember being a kid and seeing? Yeah, it? why is it this unbearable? Doing here? It was unbearable seeing a homeless person, and then as you get older, you get hardened to what? To suffering. Mm. That's not a good way to be. It's my not a good eldest, hardening. right? When she was younger, uh, we saw a homeless guy. It was a really, it was an interesting conversation that me and my wife had later on that night. Um, who's that? He's a homeless guy, right? Why is he homeless? Well, I don't know. Why don't you come and live with us? Oh. Right? Now, me and my wife look at each other and we're like, oh, it doesn't work like that. Next question. Why does it not work like that? And we're like, come on, keep on moving, keep on moving. <clears throat> That's why it's hell. Don't work like that. Mm. That dude might have just, you know, not took the decision to start a business and carried on the job, made redundant, lost his house and so on. Don't know how people end, end up where, where they're at. It's hellish. Next question anyway. Mm. <clears throat> What common traits do you see in those who successfully overcome adversity? When do you learn? Philosophy. Mm. What is adversity? Mm -hmm. Adversity is, okay, I've tried something, it didn't work, I go again. Yeah. They have a willingness to move, move on. Now, don't stick in the now. What have you learned? How can you take that forward? Do it. Can you share some unique customer retention strategies? Retention well, let's Going back strategies. to the business stuff rather than the philosophical <clears> stuff. <throat> uh, yeah, treat every customer like they're gold dust. People don't remember what you do. They may, um, who was it? Doctor, I could never remember her name. People don't remember what you do, but they always remember how you made them feel. Who said that? Mm. So how are you making your, feels, your customers feel special? So if you make every customer feel special, they'll want to come back and do more business with you. So there's um, a guy called Paddy Lund who was really good at this. Uh, the Australian dentist. I've ever spoke to you about Paddy Lund. Oh before. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the guy's a genius. He was a, he was a dentist that didn't like teeth. He didn't like bad teeth, right? So he wanted to create a business where he was only looking after good teeth, and he realised that he'd have to create something special for because he realised that the more money somebody had, the better their teeth. Funny. Um, so he created this referral-only business that you could only become a customer of Paddy's if one of Paddy's customers referred him in. And when you when you went to Paddy's dentist, um, it wasn't like a normal Paddy Lund Dentistry Limited on the front in lights. The only way that you knew it was Paddy's place is it had a golden apple on his door. And his business card was a golden apple. You'd go, okay, this must be the place. It just looked like a bungalow in nice grounds and apple trees everywhere. Knocked on the door, and you're greeted by your own personal receptionist. It says, hey, Azam, Paddy's really looking forward to seeing you. 
at your 2 p.m. appointment. Let me take you to your waiting room. You, when you walk in, you're greeted by the smell of freshly baked bread. And you know it's your waiting room because it's got your name on it and a golden star. And when he or she opens the door, it's the smell of freshly ground coffee. And you sit down to your personal subscription of your own magazines because they know the, uh, the bits of information that you like, right? So you sat there, freshly baked bread, coffee, your own magazines in your own oasis until Pani comes through at 2 p.m. goes, as I'm, I've been looking forward to seeing you. Let me take you through. Think about that from a customer experience perspective. When you go to the dentist, what are you greeted with? 422 people in a reception, all waiting for the same person, by the smell of pink stuff. What's in the pink stuff? Right? Do you touch the magazines, or are they, have they got COVID? Like, I mean, they're gross, aren't they? And the receptionist grunts at you. So, the customer, how good did they feel? Are they going to go anywhere else, ever? Mm. How much did it cost Paddy not to put a sign up, to have a receptionist that answered the door, greeted you, put a gold sticker on a door, had a bread maker, and remembered what magazines you wanted? Mm. It's all in the details, isn't it? Uh, there's a guy called, in the Guinness Book of World Records, last one. No, please. <clears throat> guy called Joe Girard. Um, who had a customer acquisition, he sold cars, had a customer acquisition cost, no, sorry, customer retention cost of $12. So you make sure that you came back and it cost him 12 quid. How would he do that? He'd send you a birthday card. He'd send you a Christmas card. He'd send you a Valentine's Day card from your car. He'd send you a Thanksgiving card because he was in America. He sent six cards every single year because he knew it, cars happen in a three-year cycle. In three years, he's going to come for another car. We had 18 cars from 18 cards from Joe in the last three years. Dare you go anywhere else? Mm -hmm. Retention. Mm -hmm. So take so we have a critical non essentials checklist in our business, right? So when we onboard a new customer, we get all these things from them. We know when their birthday is. We know when they started their business. We know what their partner's names are if they have a partner. Um, we know what their hobbies are like. We know what drink they have. And why should I ask you what drink you want? I should know what drink you want and it should be ready for you, surely, mm. or at least brewing. You should get a card on your birthday. Because I remember when your birthday is. Celebrate with you. How much does that cost? Making sure I make a drink ahead of time. Send you a birthday card in your business. Quit a year. Mm. It's not difficult, is it? So um, start with the basic stuff. Yeah, I like it. And love what you do. Did you answer this? How do you coach business owners to manage work-life balance effectively? No. Dad. So how do you coach <coughs> business owners to manage the work-life balance? Define what balance is. Balance is different to everybody. <sighs> That's true. And it's 24 hours in a day. That's the only currency that is e equal to us all. Some start with a million quid in the bank. Some start with none. Some are born into the royal family. Some are not. Some are born into poverty. The only thing that we all start with is that finite resource of time. So the first thing you've got to do is define what balance is. Does that mean 12 hours at work and 12 hours at home? Does that mean that we're balancing the waking hours of the day? So 9 till 10, let's say. So those 12 hours or 13 hours or 14 hours. The first thing is to help somebody define what balance is. What great looks like? Where am I now? And then what's the trajectory to get there? If I'm working 12 hours a day, I'm not going to beat myself up about that because you are where you are. Mm -hmm. But at least spend some time going, well, what, what is it that I actually want? If balance is eight hours, I've got four to find. I'm not going to go on Monday doing 12 hours, Tuesday doing eight. Possible, plausible, probably not. So I go, okay, so in 90 days, where do we want to be? What does success look like? If we go from 12 to 11, are you happy on a scale from one to 10? So know where you're at, know where it's going. Because <laughs> mm. the amount of stupid shit we all do with our time, do a time audit. Where, is, where am I wasting time? Where can I get some back from? Where can I delegate out to some people? And then set a target and work backwards. Don't be the guy in 12 months time going, you know, 
I'm still doing 12 hours a day. First person asking that question, they want some balance, all right? All right, I've got one more question for you. Oh, okay. No, I haven't. I've got two. Okay. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned about yourself through coaching others? About life or business? About yourself. About yourself. What, did you, what have you learned about you? That life is a people game. Life is a people game. You get really good with people, life becomes easier. That's what I've learned. That's a good lesson. It's true though, isn't it? It's if a you look lesson. at generally the most su successful or happiest people, they're just good with people. Yeah, be kind and have manners. Master the art of people. They'll get you in well, comfortably anyway. These, so the golden rule is treat people how you want to be treated. It's a good rule. Ish. Well, do you want to be treated the same way as me? Do no. I want to be treated the same way as you? No. Right, so golden rule doesn't apply, does it? fluffier than you. So what's the... Oh, yeah, much fluffier. <laughs> what's the platinum rule? Treat people the way they'd like to be treated. Right. Find out what good is for them mm. and do that. Because people remember the beep. People remember that stuff. <clears throat> I'm sorry for swearing, Mum. You're going to send her this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's my only viewer. Of things. That's interesting. <laughs> my mum was sending me... You're the viewer. When I started doing this, my mum was sending me Parkinson's videos. Going, nice. No offence, just, <laughs> just watch that. Do you support act? <laughs> All right. What's mm. your other one? I think, uh, I think we're done with these. So my the last question then. Um... Shall we sp separate it out? Let's separate it out. So it'll be two questions. First question, we're going to imagine that on the countdown from three and what you say next is going to go out to every business owner or hope prospective business owner in the world, right? We're going to do the same question. Mm -hmm. It's going to go out to every person in the world, every man, woman, a child going through whatever they're going through all over the world. Okay. So the first one, just for business owners. Mm-hmm. Right. What do you want to say to them? Three, two, one. Shaboom. Well done. No. Oh. Took the leap. Well done. I salute you. No. Oh. Yeah. Good man. Well done, man. All right. <laughs> Save again <laughs> to everyone in the Gonna world. Gonna do a joke one <laughs> first. You want? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> to humanity. To the whole of the world, yeah. So everybody, every okay. little kid, yeah, yeah. everyone. Right, three, two, one, go. You can do it. I'll tell you a quick story about that. Go. <clears throat> um, I'm a big believer in affirmation. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean by affirmation? Affirming things. Say it over and over and over again. Yeah, positively well, not just that. Bring just it to life. You say things out. I mean, everybody does affirmation, right? Imposter. Do I have to say it out loud for me to have said it? Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm saying, well, you can't do that, Johnny boy, mm -hmm. that's that's a mentally affirming thing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why I say you could do it, talk about my eldest again. When she was a little bit younger. Oh, my wife. She keeps me in check, you know. Um, when we used to brush our teeth together in the morning, she, doesn't, she didn't want to have any, anything to do with me in a minute. Just turn, just about to turn into a teenager. That stage. Um, when we used to brush it, I used to ask her a question every single morning. What are you destined for? Mm. She used to say, I'm destined for greatness. And I used to do that with her every single morning. So I just wanted to help her understand that whatever she wanted to commit to, she could become, right? That's my youngest now. What are you destined for? What are you destined for? She turned up one day and said, um, we were talking about something. She went, that's what I want to do when, when, when I grow up. I was like, oh, okay, I'm in. You know, welcome, Dad. Get in the hot seat. This is what I'm good at. I can help you with this. Mm. She went, I'm going to be a cleaner. And I sank. I said, Rainy, you're not going to be a cleaner. You can be anything that you want to be. You can be the greatest. And I went at her for probably for about two minutes. Go in and consider your options, young child. Mm. And when she left the room, my wife was looking at me from the corner going, it's the 
I told her, you said, I told her that she could be whatever she wanted to be. She can do whatever she wants to do, provided she puts her mind to it. Mm. If she wants to clean, let the girl clean. And I was like, it's a fair cop. I've just diminished this young person's dreams. So I immediately went upstairs, <clears throat> apologized to my now teenage daughter, soon to be teenage daughter. I said, I'm sorry. You want to be a cleaner, you be a cleaner. You just make a promise. You be the best cleaner you can be. <laughs> so I will be, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to show you, Dad. Check me out. And then went <laughs> off it. And, but you can do whatever you want to do. Go do it. Don't live your life in regret. Be disciplined enough to do. Mm. That's what I would say to all human beings out there. No matter where you find yourself right now, you can get out of it. Provided you do. Go do. Do something. Enjoy that? Yeah. You? Yeah, always. I came over here just just for you. That's love. Yeah, it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again. No problems, my man. And thanks to the gang at Seven Studios for hosting us. More than seven. <laughs> <laughs>